Hey everybody and welcome to another JASP video. In this video, we are going to continue our chat on the Learn Stats module. There it is, statistics with a twist. Learn classical statistics with simple examples and supporting text. Before we jump into the next function of this module, just a reminder to get Learn Stats, uh, even in its, you know, kind of beta form, uh, you do need to get 0 0.18.1 and you'll have that Learn Stats module. So Download that, join in, and follow along. In this video, we are going to talk about effect sizes. This is going to be a pretty meaty video because there's a lot to do in the effect size function of the Learn Stats module. So let's jump right in. Okay, so as you can see, we start off with the effect size module. And that module can either do Cohen's delta or D, uh, if you will. Delta is used here because we're talking about a population versus an estimation statistic. D would be the statistic. Delta, lowercase delta here, would be the population parameter. We can also do Pearson's correlation coefficient rho, again, the population parameter for Pearson's r, which is the statistic, and then the contingency coefficient phi or phi. I pronounce it phi. I'm probably wrong. Uh, you can at me in the comments. That's fine. Uh, contingency co coefficient phi, this is the effect size for doing an independent uh, or test of independent, I should say, chi-square. So we have those three, and then we can simulate data, which will bring up a different graph here. And then we have some advanced statistics and options for each of these. So what I'd like to do is go through each of these, explain what's happening, uh, both on the options setting side and then on the results output side. So let's first do Cohen's D since it's the default one selected. Um, and what I want to do is, as you can see here, it'll put the, ex the explanatory text is not uh, not selectable right now, but as soon as we make some changes to um, some of these settings, it will pop up and it will allow us to change it. Now, as you can see here, we've got Cohen's D and we've got our options of Delta. So setting whatever population standard, or excuse me, not standard deviation, population effect size there. Um, we can have the mean of our control group. That's what C stands for. And then we can set the standard deviation through Sigma for our control group. And you can see here control and experimental are right next to each other and they are overlapping. The other thing we can do if we want to change our inputs is we can specify population characteristics. So that takes away Cohen's D and allows us to put in the means of our controls and our experimental groups and then the pooled standard deviation. So if I uncheck that just to just to clarify here, this is the mean and the standard deviation for the control group and you are setting the D as the difference between the control and the experimental group. But then you can also specify the population characteristics again. This would be the mean of the control group, the mean of the experimental group, and then the pooled standard deviation, which is what you need to calculate Cohen's D anyway. So you can do it either way. Just to show you how this works here, uh, again, we can uh, set Cohen's D as, let's do a large effect size, um, and the, we'll leave the control group as a normal distribution, zero, one. Click off of that, and what it'll do is it will separate my two distributions, and there you go. But we can also do specify population characteristics, and we can say that the mean of control group is zero, the experimental group is one, and the pooled standard deviation is one. And what you'll see again is the separation of the two distributions. So either way that you want to do that, that's fine. Now, um, I'm going to leave it here and we're going to simulate some data. So JASP is going to run 100 observations and you can change this number, run 100 observations uh, by default uh, and it will produce uh, overlapping histograms. OK, and so here you go. You have the control group is green and the experimental group as orange. And then the two overlapping is this kind of brown color. But there you go. Uh, and, and this is all. Uh, simulated data, and I'm assuming with 100 observations, they split it down the middle with 50 for control and 50 for experimental. It kind of looks like that. Although, again, the axes here leave a lot to be desired because 10 is the max of the graph, but the histogram uh, bins go a lot higher than that. So I don't know. You think of that what you will. A couple of things to get out of the way. We can um, combine population and simulation. I'm going to show you what this looks like, but I'm not going to leave it like this uh, because what it'll do is it'll just make a very messy graph with lots of colors, lots of lines, lots of overlapping, which is fine. I mean, many people like doing this because they can show it, but it puts the, the labels on the top of the, the curves as opposed to off to the side. It's kind of rough. And then it only shows you density as opposed to the frequency for the histogram. So I like the I like them being separate um, and you can combine population simulation for um, all of these if you'd like. So down here, we get a statistics summary from our two distribution graphs. We get the population, we get the simulation of Cohen's D, right? So the population Cohen's D is one because I set them to be that way. And then the simulation Cohen's D is actually 0.898 or 0.9, so fairly close. And then we get a 95% confidence interval for that, which is incredibly important, right? Uh, 
a bit of additional statistics you can get. You can get Cohen's U3. And now, as you can see, me doing all of this and playing with uh, different, uh, now simulating data, apparently there's a connection between that and the explanatory text. So Cohen's D gives you what it means, the conventions that Cohen set in his paper, and then what Cohen's U3 responds to, or corresponds to, I should say. U3, you can see that there's no superscript or subscript here, but you can see that it's a subscript here. Cohen's U3, uh, corresponds to the proportion of the control group that is surpassed by the upper upper half of the experimental group. I'm assuming that's only one upper half is supposed to be here. So how much is surpassed in the orange uh, versus the green, right? So the upper half, so the top uh, the upper 50 percentile, how much is, uh, surpasses the um, control group, right? So this amount. And we can see here that U3 in our simulation is 0.815, whereas the U3 in the population is 0.84. If That will always be 0.841 if you have this information here. But our simulation could always be different depending on what information is pulled. And then we have our confidence interval for U3 as well. You can also bring in the overlap. So how much do these two uh, distributions overlap? Overlap corresponds to the common, uh, that should say, area of the control and experimental density. That's the brown colors here, right? So that's the amount of overlap. It's about 65% in the simulation, but only about 62% in the population distribution. Um, the probability of superiority, as you can see here, probability of superiority corresponds to the probability that a randomly chosen participant from the 100, from the experimental group, will, or excuse me, out of the 50, will have a higher value than a randomly chosen participant from the control group, right? So we pluck one from the 50, and then the other from the 50, and then what's that probability? It's about 76% in the population distribution. 76% and about 74%, so pretty close. And then we've got a pretty tight 95% confidence interval, 0.666, ooh. And then finally, the last option that you can do is the number needed to treat. Default is the event rate of 50-50. So number needed to treat corresponds to the number of participants in the experimental group that would be required to observe one more successful outcome than in the control group, right? So this is three people and this is four people at 50-50, right? So three more people in the population uh, distribution, would need to be treated to observe one more successful outcome and then four for the uh, simulation. OK, so that's what and then you can change this percentage if you want um, and it will change the amount needed to treat. So three versus four. It's pretty good. Finally, uh, the last option here is you can get a rain cloud plot. Um, I didn't know these were called rain cloud plots, but um, you'll see the GG plot two and R can do rain cloud plots pretty nicely. But what it'll do is it'll put all 50 dots here in a bit of a scatter, sort of a, a bin scatter. Same with the experimental group. Put all of the uh, X values on the Y axis here. We will get the um, box, box and whisker plots right for our quartiles. And you can see here that the experimental group is slightly higher and then you all have the distributions. You can see that there's slightly less variability or slightly more variability, I should say, in the control group than in the experimental group. So this is a great little plot to show I, um, these two uh, bits exist outside of the actual graph, uh, but it's all one thing if you want to take the image and roll with it. And of course, resizing will give you um, graph resizing to make it look a little bit nicer. And then you can repeat this simulation by setting a seed number. So that is how you do Cohen's D in the effects sizes function of the Learn Stats module. Let's go ahead and duplicate this analysis, copy of effect sizes, and let's go to Pearson's. Okay. So now, the cool thing about doing this all together, right, regardless if it says copy of effect size, don't worry about that, um, is that our, our option of explanatory text stays here, as well as our simulating data stays here. So by if you change any of these by default within the same JASP experience within this, you know, using JASP, um, you know, at the same session, we'll say um, it'll keep those two options selected. Let's expand the advanced options menu so we can take a look at them. OK, so um, for Pearson's correlation coefficient, what ends up happening is the population distribution and the simulation distribution are uh, put side by side unless you change the size of these graphs. And then um, I think one will move below the other. So by by default, let's just like let's just keep this here. Right. So the population distribution shows you the density of your um, two variables, x1 and x2, and it shows you with the darkest lines, if we set both of those means to zero and their standard deviations to zero, what happens here, right? Our row is no, and so we get concentric circles showing that it's very unlikely with the shades of blue, very unlikely to have any kind of correlation. And then if we look at our simulation of 100 dots, you can see our two variables with their means around zero. This would be kind of a flat line. But if you wanted to take a look at that, you can ask for show regression line. And what it'll do is it'll put regression lines on both of these. Now, the regression line for this one at zero is just a horizontal line. Horizontal line, sort of a diameter through all of these uh, concentric circles. The population, or excuse me, the simulation uh, is not actually a uh, flat zero line, because if we come down here, you can see our simulation actually gave us a negative 0.05 correlation coefficient, right? And so, and then we have our 95% um, confidence interval, which is represented by this gray 
uh, with this gray kind of skirt, I guess, around the line, where the density of the dots around both of these means is less uncertain, less uncertain or more certain, weird. Um, and then a away is more uncertain. So the skirt gets a little bit bigger. I forgot what they call the gray, the gray outline here. I forgot what they call it. Uh, I haven't made a graph in um, ggplot2 in a while, so I, I, I forget here. Um, but of course, this is a not significant R value, which is effectively zero, right? Because our confidence interval includes the value zero. So, you know, we could say they're effectively the same, right? No correlation. Um, and then with the explanatory text tells you what the, the strength of the relationship between um, two continuous variables, strength and direction, and then the rules of thumb, although they put thumbs here. The rules of thumbs. I wish I had a uh, face cam so I could put my thumbs up here. Thumbs up, yeah, for interpreting the measure R 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, small, medium, large, respectively. Okay, so we can do that and we can change these if we want to. If you make it uh, 0 0.1, take a look at what happens with our distribution. So our uh, regression line gets a little bit uh, more pitched, right? And if we change this to 0.3, what happens to the oval and the line? Look at that going through the center there again, going through the center. OK, and then 0.5, our oval gets even more stretched on the population distribution. Click off of that more stretch. There we go. And you can see the regression line goes through there. And same thing with this. And one thing you'll note is that around these two means, the confidence interval is quite zero and zero right here. Very tight. Those values are quite clustered to that regression line. So you can change these values. You can play with um, standard deviations, all of that kind of stuff. You can also ask for uh, shared variance. So the shared variance goes down here, the statistic summary. As you know, uh, 0.5 squared is 0.25. So our numbers get smaller. Multiplying two decimals next to each other makes a smaller decimal. OK, and then our simulation um, is about right. Right. So instead of 0.5, our simulation got 0.39. Not as good. Right. And so our R squared for this simulation is 0.149. So you can use this if you need to for homework assignments that are asking for um, asking for R squared. That's calculation for you. Again, you can combine the population and simulation graphs again, makes them very um, messy and busy. But what I like about this is you can kind of see the difference between the regression lines here, right? So our, our, our population is, is 0.5, right? That's this black line here. And then, but our simulation is 0.38 and you can see it's a little less steep, right? It's a little more horizontal because it's a smaller regression line, right? So there you go. That's how you do uh, effect sizes for Pearson's correlation coefficient rho. Uh, also, it gives you the shared variance and what that means down here. And then of course you can repeat this stimulation. Let's do one more because we got to do the contingency coefficient. So let's copy of a copy. Yeah, a copy of a copy. And let's do contingency coefficient again. So if you copy this, right? So I've got my explanatory text and I've got my simulate data on there as well. OK, and again, you can specify the population characteristics, which tells us uh, the probability of getting any of these values. We can combine simulation and population, but I'm going to uncheck that so you can see what the difference looks like, right? So this is our population distribution. It's 0.25 uh, percent. I should sorry, 0.25 probability to achieve any of these four outcomes. But that's specifying population characteristics, right? If we uncheck that, then this kind of looks like our our Cohen's d. If we're unspecifying, right, where we specify what Cohen's d is. So here we are. We can specify what our fee is, and then we specify the probability of a success for both of our variables. Again, this is for test of independence chi square. So. The idea is that we've got two variables, two categorical variables, and we want to know whether or not these are two independent. So our null hypothesis is that uh, they are independent of each other. And so our alternative hypothesis is that they are not independent of each other. And so if we get a significant effect fee here, the contingency coefficient tells us how related these two variables are. And so again, in the population distribution, you kind of have to expand these out to get like useful square diagrams here. But the way that I like is it shows you the um, proportion distance away from a center, right? So zero, zero. And then it just gives you the probability of failure for both and the probability for success, success for both. And then one of the other probabilities for success. And then our sampling distribution, again, um, is out of 100 observations. So what happened? How many how many x equals one did we get? How many y equals one did we get? Um, and then each of the situations. So um, you can see here, it, this is the population 0.25 goes here, right? Because we specified that up here. And then these are our actual probabilities 100 times. So out of 100 flips, we got 30 uh, x is equal to one and y is equal to one and 16 of zero, zero. And then uh, point uh, 30, 31 times we got x of one and y of one, uh, y of zero, and then uh, 23 times we got uh, x of zero and y of one. So that's how that works out, and these are shown showed by these blocks here, and so you can kind of tell how that works. And then when we do this, we get our um, fee simulation values, right? So our fee coefficient is what we are looking for. Okay, so if you take a look here. Um, the probability of X being a success, right, is 50% in our population. And we ended up getting 0.61 because we add uh, these two together, 0.3 and 0.31, right? So we got 0.61.
Probability of y equals one, or y is a success, population is 50%, we got 0.53, okay? Because we added these, uh, uh, y is one, these two together. Now that doesn't sum to 100% because we are only looking at the probability that either of these was successful, okay? These will sum, all four of these will sum to 100%, okay? So what's our fee coefficient? So we're we're trying to see whether or not our two variables are, are independent of each other, right? So zero, uh, a co fee coefficient of zero means they are independent, okay? And our simulation gave us 0.1. Well, the interesting thing is, is that a weak one is 0.2. So we're we're OK right there. I would still consider this a value. And it's, look at that. It's, it's in between zero. I would still consider this a value to suggest that these two things are independent of each other. But what if we decided that we want to give it, we want to make it a strong, according to this, 0.4 strong. Let's see what happens here, right? So a difference between, uh, a 0.4 difference between our two variables uh, would mean that two of them are not successful as much as the other two, right? So our... Um, X uh, of success for both and failure for both is more common in our population by by using 0.4 here than success for either of them. Okay, and what ends up happening is we get a very similar situation here. Okay, so 0.33 to 0.35, pretty similar. 0 0.13 to 0.15, very similar. 0.15 to 0.18, very similar. And 0.35 to 0.36, very similar. So if we say the probability of X equals one is 50% because we set that up here, how close do we do? 0.46. We added these two together. Okay. And then the probability of Y success or Y is one is 0.5 in our population and 0.51, right? We're summing these two together. We did pretty good on Y. And then our fee coefficient, pretty good, 0.38 in our simulation. Okay. So then, and then we've got our 95% confidence intervals for our simulation. So you can show what happens in the simulation distribution when you compare it to a population distribution. You can also get additional statistics and uh, the, um, the, uh, Flavor text here, the explanatory text will tell you what that corresponds to the ratio of the odds of event occurring in the experimental and control groups, right? Experimental control groups, categorical variables. The odds ratio here is 5.44. Um, in our simulation, it was 5.08 or 5.077. So um, about the same there. We can do the risk ratio. Risk ratio corresponds to the ratio of the risk of an event occurring in experimental control groups. So odds ratio, risk ratio are two ratios that are used in different situations. So if you want to know the chances of something occurring uh, when you compare the two groups versus the risk of something occurring, right? So risk is bad. Odds is generally good. Uh, depends on how you use them. And then you can get risk difference. Risk difference corresponds to the difference in the risk of the event occurring between the experimental and the control groups. So it's a difference score as opposed to just a score score. All right. And the risk difference is very similar to the fee coefficient. Okay. You can also combine population and simulation. It does dashed lines for the, I believe, the simulation. Yeah. Dashed lines for the simulation as opposed to the population. That's not very clear. And they should have some kind of legend that explains that here. I mean, you can go look at the, the frequencies and, and determine which one's which, but I think it would be better if they showed that. Okay. You can also do a mosaic plot, which puts everything from zero to 100. I actually think this shows the uh, differences a lot better uh, if we were to expand these out just a little bit more. Okay. Um, it shows the differences a little bit better, right? Because we're, we're talking about out of 100, right? These are our options. So all of these sum to 100, all of these sum to 100. So I think mosaic plot also works. You can show the proportions on the graphs uh, if you want as well. The proportions work a lot better when you make the graphs a little bit bigger. Uh, of course, you don't want them all smushed. Um, and I think they look um, a little bit better in the mosaic plot um, than they do in the other kinds of plots. Um, at, but as you can see, it's a bit same, same. It depends on how big you make fee, right? So there you go. And then again, you can set your seed to be repeatable or not. So that is how you do contingency coefficient fee in the learn stats module of effect sizes. That's effect sizes for you. Uh, and I think this is a great teaching and learning tool, playing around with it. It's, it creates a, th these three, these three uh, things create a great sandbox for students and teachers to play with. And you best, uh, you best know that I am going to be using these in my classes for uh, the future. Even if I don't have students use JASP for data analysis, I can just quickly pull this up and start playing with, with some numbers. And that's going to do it for this episode. Please leave your comments, suggestions, questions, and other feedback down in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.